Welcome to Star Cares, a weekly program that delves into the issues that impact you and your family. This program is a public affairs feature of this radio station. Now, here's your host, Michael Leach. Most adults will suffer an occasional bout with heartburn called acid reflux or simply reflux. And according to the American College of Gastroenterology, 60 million Americans experience heartburn at least once a month. What's going on? Let's talk about it. My guest today is Dr. Mart Ratner. He's a urologist as well as the chief science officer for Therologics. Dr. Ratner, good morning and welcome to Star Cares. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Let's just begin with a basic. What is heartburn? What is acid reflux? And what does GERD stand for anyhow? Sure. The contents of our stomach are acidic. That's uh, the normal situation. And that stomach acid is necessary for proper digestion. What happens is sometimes the acidic contents of the stomach, which are supposed to stay in the stomach, will reflux backwards up into the food tube or esophagus. And when that happens, and it's because of a weak muscle where the esophagus joins the stomach, what happens is the acidic contents will reflux backwards up into the food tube. And that's what we call heartburn, typically a burning sensation kind of in the midline of the chest, sometimes up into the throat. And so it's called heartburn or acid reflux. And when that happens several times a week, and in many people it happens every day, doctors will call that GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. So what causes it? What's well, actually caused by a weakness in the sphincter muscle, which is right where the food tube connects to the stomach. And so it's not because of something they've done or not done, although there are certain things that can make it worse once it is happening. So how is it diagnosed and then how is it often treated? The diagnosis is not really complicated. You know, somebody will go in and say to their doctor, you know, I'm getting this trouble burning sensation and it's typically worse when, when somebody lies down. It may be made worse by certain foods. So when people have heartburn, they kind of know it. However, there are some some conditions, if this is happening on a regular basis, it can lead to more serious conditions, in which case the doctor may suggest some tests uh, to rule those more serious conditions out. You mentioned that there were some things that could make some of the symptoms worse. Can you talk about a few of those areas? Sure. We know that people who are overweight, there's more pressure on their stomach, and that can cause the contents to reflux backwards. We also know that in some instances, Alcohol or very spicy food can make that problem worse. Cigarette smoking has been shown to increase the risk of acid reflux. Something as simple as a very tight belt. People who wear sort of clothes that are very tight or belts that are very tight, they can put pressure on the stomach and cause uh, reflux to be more noticeable. Speaking about pressure on the stomach, would pregnancy influence? Some pregnant women will have acid reflux that they've never gotten before. They only get it during their pregnancy. Yep, absolutely. Eating before bedtime, which is kind of like a pastime for me, is... <laughs> Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's one of the steps. So the question that you asked, which is once it's happening, how can we treat it? There are diet and lifestyle steps which can be helpful. One of those things is don't eat for several hours before bedtime because if you're laying down, that makes it much easier for the food to kind of move backwards up the tube and your stomach is very full. It's going to be worse. Keep talking about the diet and lifestyle changes. We actually have an ebook which is available for free download that talks about not only you know what's causing the acid reflux, but the diet and lifestyle steps that you can take to reduce it. And then the other steps, because diet and lifestyle, in many instances, not going to be enough. And so some instances, we we start using these medications, which are called PPIs or proton pump inhibitors, which actually stop the stomach from producing acid. Tell us about the lifestyle changes where we can help ourselves. We mentioned a couple of those already, one being alcohol, spicy food, don't eat before bedtime, weight loss. It's a sort of a matter of experimentation for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You have to try these things for a few days and see if it helps the problem. How does caffeine impact? Some people, some people are sensitive to caffeine, but typically Typically, that's, that's not as big an, uh, an issue as alcohol. And what about exercising? Does that help us to digest and move things along at all? Mm, insofar as exercise can help with weight loss, absolutely. Because we do know that weight loss reduces acid reflux. Exercise per se directly affecting reflux, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. So you have your own story, though, right? You experienced yeah. this yeah. personally. So this is not just you, the doctor, sort of telling other people about it and telling them what to do. Tell us your story and what happened with you. Sure. So what happened to me was probably 20 years ago or so, I was having just acid reflux on a daily basis. It was a 
very un- uncomfortable and unpleasant. And I was chatting with a friend of mine who was an internist, and he gave me some samples of Prilosec, which is what's called, as I mentioned a moment ago, a PPI or proton pump inhibitor, which completely blocks stomach acid production. I started taking these pills one a day, and it was like somebody had just flipped a switch. I mean, my symptoms went completely away. And what what these medications do is they don't stop the reflux. They just make the stomach contents no longer acidic. So you don't feel the reflux anymore. And so... <laughs> This was like a miracle. It was amazing. However, about seven or eight years after I started taking the medication, one night, the middle of the night, I woke up with my heart pounding out of my chest. The middle of the night, I ended up in the emergency room. Make a long story short, I had developed an arrhythmia, an irregular heartbeat. And it turned out that that came from a low magnesium level. That was the only thing they found that explained it. How did I get a low magnesium level? It was because I had been on Prilosec, It's now called omeprazole, that's the generic name, for like seven or eight years, and it had blocked my absorption of magnesium and actually vitamin B12 as well. Aren't these short-term solutions rather than long-term? You are on there for you. It's a very good point. The e-book that we have for download, the title of it is The Prisoner of Prilosec. And that's jokingly what I call myself, because you're right, absolutely, these are intended for short-term use. You know, they're now over the counter. You don't even need a prescription for them. But if you buy them over the counter, they typically come packaged in a 14-day supply, because that's what the FDA allows them to package. The package will say, you're supposed to only use this for 14 days. And after that, you know, you should discuss longer use with your doctor. It's like 15 million people in the United States that are taking these medications on a daily basis, and three quarters of them are doing it without a prescription. So So you're right. Absolutely. You're only supposed to take these for a few days. But the problem is, if you try to stop them, once you've been on one of these PPIs, like omeprazole, um, which is now the generic name for Prilosec, once you've been on them for more than a few months, if you try to stop them, it's like you think you're going to die because your stomach starts to overproduce acid. It rebounds and you develop symptoms that are just unmanageable. I mean, chest pain, abdominal pain, diarrhea, it's misery. What happens is most people just give up and they go back on it. So what I do now instead is I supplement magnesium I supplement vitamin B12 to make up for those deficiencies that I'm probably at risk for on a continuing basis because I take this medication on a daily basis. So it has some other side effects. You talked about the low magnesium and you talked about what is it, the B12. Are there other risks that people should be aware of? Right, right. Well, um, yes, there are. Um, Unfortunately, it always gets me nervous when I talk about this because I realize, oh my boy, you know, I'm 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 going to have to, you know, keep an eye out for these as well. You can lose bone density from these medications, so you can develop osteoporosis. There's the studies that show that. There's studies that there may be a link. This is not quite the nailed down, but there could be a link between use of these TPIs and dementia. There could also be a link between PPIs and kidney function, problems with kidney function. So they're not entirely harmless medications, but there's a lot of people who are more or less addicted to them because it's just very, very difficult to stop them. So how does a person know if their body is becoming depleted in magnesium or B12? Are there symptoms? Great question. This should be discussed with your, your primary care doctor. And, you know, for people who take these medications over the counter, Sometimes they forget to tell the doctor. Oh, it's, they think it's not a prescription medication, and they forget to tell their doctor. But if you're taking these medications, then when you go to see your doctor, say for an annual checkup, uh, a vitamin B12 level and a magnesium level should be part of the routine blood work. Can you increase the magnesium levels by eating certain foods, or is supplementation necessary? Well, in this situation... This is one of those situations where diet alone is probably not going to be enough and supplementation is necessary. And the reason is because these medications are blocking your ability to absorb the magnesium from food. Uh, And so the type of magnesium that you want to take and the type of vitamin B12 that you want to take as a supplement should be high absorption forms and typically at a higher dose than you would be able to get in food so that you're going to get enough despite being on the PPI. So we're countering the side effects with vitamin B12 and magnesium. Are there other things that we could be taking? Because you talked about the bone density. What about calcium? Well, that's a, another thing that after you've been on this medication, type of medication for a long time, a bone density test 
is probably not a bad idea. This is probably going to be more useful and more necessary in a woman who, let's say, after menopause is going to have a a risk of bone loss just from other causes. But certainly being on a PPI can make that worse. Getting a bone density test, Mm -hmm. we call it DEXA scan, uh, would be a great idea. If somebody's listening right now and they're popping those pills because they have this this reflux, what are some of the steps that you would say that they should take immediately? And then we can give the information about the ebook. What should they be doing right now? Well, I think the safest thing is to supplement magnesium and vitamin B12, um, which are inexpensive and very well tolerated. A lot of people think, oh, if I'm low in vitamin B12, don't I need to get that by a shot? You know, the old B12 shots or B12 injections. And actually, you can take it by mouth. And uh, if you take the right form, it's just as effective. So I think supplementing B12 and and magnesium is is a great idea. And by all means, if you have reflux that's really bad and you've been on a PPI for a long time, talk to your doctor about uh, the steps you might be able to take to get off of it. You know, there are some procedures that gastroenterologists actually do uh, which can actually stop the reflux. The types of procedures that they typically will do involve trying to tighten up that muscle. Now, you know, of course, these are sort of invasive procedures where they got to put scopes down in there and, and do those kinds of things. And they don't always work, but in many instances, they can be effective. There are steps that can be taken, um, but for somebody who is, like me, a, a prisoner of Prilosec, and by the way, I don't want to just pick on Prilosec, there's a bunch of these medications, there's Nexium and Protonix and Prevacid. These are all what we call PPIs. If you're a prisoner of a, PP, of a PPI, then supplementing B12 and magnesium is probably a safe thing to do. Absolutely. Getting to the doctor to see how you can get out of that habit. So how can we learn more information and where can we get a copy of the free ebook that you talked about? Yeah, the ebook is available for download. It's free. It's, um, the website is PPI Help. Dot O-R-G. So it's P-P-I-H-E-L-P dot O-R-G. Uh, and it's, uh, the, the e-book is called The Prisoner of Prilosec, What You Need to Know About Acid Reflux, GERD, and PPIs. And it really, it sort of, it starts off just with my story about how I ended up in the emergency room. But it then goes into, you know, how reflux happens, diet and lifestyle management. Um, and then if you're on a PPI, you know, how you protect yourself. PPIHelp.org. 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 Dr. Mark Ratner, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's been my pleasure. And thank you for listening. Won't you join me again next Sunday for another Sunday edition of Star Cares? I'm Michael Leach, and I am praying that the rest of your week is wonderful. Wonderful.